Manaus, Vitor and um, Eric for inviting me to come here today. I don't have pictures of Eduardo, but I'll, I'll speak a little bit in the end, not in the beginning. So uh, I'll be talking today, oh, it's gone, about the geometrical effects on the thermal power properties of correlated electrons. Oops. And I'll start acknowledging my collaborators. So uh, Will Dawani was uh, the one who led this work. And Nathanael, who is our chair. Michael from Federal do Piauí. And the, the group from uh, Ohio State also took part on this work. And it's on archive now. So the summary of my talk, I'll start briefly discussing thermoelectric materials and the thermal power, which is the central quantity I want to discuss today. And then I'll uh, come to the Hubbard model. I think we are here in, on an expert audience, but anyway, I'll speak briefly about it. And then I'll go to the CBAC coefficient and power factor and come to the conclusions. So uh, thermoelectric effects have a very important uh, impacts on uh, technology, it's a way to turn thermic into electric energy and the other way around. So, uh, okay. So the idea here is uh, how to induce voltage in the presence of a temperature gradient and the thermoelectric materials are the ones that do that. And just uh, there is a very nice uh, early on uh, Physics Today article on, on that. So uh, for those of you that, as me, didn't know much about it, it's, it's an interesting uh, thing to read. So uh, a key quantity uh, in uh, quantifying the thermoelectric properties is the figure of merit. So here I show the A-dimensional one, which is Z times uh, the temperature. And it's composed of these three quantities, S, which is the thermal power or z back coefficient, which measures the conversion efficiency from thermal to electrical energy, the conductivity sigma, uh, the temperature here, and the thermal conductivity. So it's we want to maximize Z, so we have to take into care the interplay of these quantities. And so in the early days, what we had is um, metals have uh, low Z back coefficient, so not very useful to increase Z. In insulators, the Z back coefficient is high, but on the other hand, we have small conductivity. So doped insulators use it to be uh, on the time that uh, article was written, the best choice for uh, thermoelectric materials. So uh, here, uh, by the end, I'll be discussing not the figure of merit, but the power factor, which is uh, only the numerator of this quantity. And it also uh, is something we want to maximize. So uh, in looking uh, in more recent years, correlated materials have appeared as uh, uh, possible uh, materials where uh, we have large Z-back coefficients. So one of those is this compound of sodium, cobalt, and oxygen, which has a very large Z-back coefficient, and there are some early works on that. And uh, also something very interesting, interesting is that on cuprates, there is a, a sign, change, sign change of the Seebeck coefficient near optimum doping. And there is a lot of physics involved in that. And I'll discuss some of it. So uh, the questions I want to answer here are uh, these two. How is the thermal power affected by uh, geometry, so we are going to look into different geometries, and how is it affected by correlations. So to do so, I'll use the Hubbard model. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. 
Okay. So to do so, we'll study the Hubbard model. And here, just a cartoon. We have uh, a given lattice, and we have different geometries. We are going to study it on square, triangular, and honeycomb lattices. And we study the, uh, the near neighbor Hubbard model. So we have hopping only from nearest neighbors. And we have uh, on-site energy U. And although it's a very simple Hamiltonian, there is no known analytical solutions in 2D. So we are going to use uh, quantum Monte Carlo to study this model on different lattices. And I am not going to say much about uh, quantum Monte Carlo. Let me just try to. I'm not giving much details on the calculation, but I think some details are important. So uh, for the square lattices, we studied 100 sites, a 10 by 10 lattice for the triangular 144 and for the honeycomb 162. In each run, we did 2,000 warm-up sweeps and 5,000 measurement sweeps. For each given configuration, we usually use a 10 uh, of such Runs, we use a delta tau smaller than 0.1, and we studied a range of uh, interaction strengths. And uh, it's, it's, I just wanted to point out that as we are going to do sweeps through densities, we did like 500 jobs for each temperature and interaction strength. And as we, you're going to see, I use uh, some uh, derivatives of the temperature. And to get a derivative, I need three points, so uh, 1,500 jobs. So I just wanted to point out that it is a uh, tour of force to, to do that. So uh, I'll start uh, with uh, the dispersion relations for these three geometries. Uh, results for the square lattices are very well known. Uh, and uh, in the, for the three geometries, as we are in 2D, we have unhold singularities here. And the square lattice, it's uh, at omega equals 0. Here at the honeycomb lattice, uh, it's also a uh, bipartite lattice, so we have uh, symmetry. And here, the triangular lattice is the more challenging for us, as uh, it's not particle hole symmetric, and we don't see symmetry around omega equals 0. Oh, I think I, I've uh, placed it here. So we have particle hole symmetry in these two cases, but not for the triangular lattice. So what happens when we turn on correlations? So here I plot the density as a function of chemical potential. And uh, these uh, colorful things here are the different values of u. So for u equals 0, we have the black line uh, where interactions are turned off. And then red, blue, green, orange, and uh, the purple one, which is the highest U value we have. And uh, once again, uh, particle hole symmetry is explicit here, where we see that N of minus mu is 2 minus N of N mu for both the square and the honeycomb. But uh, the interesting thing here is we see that as we increase U, we start to form this plateau here at half filling. And this is the mod transition being seen already at this uh, somewhat high value of temperature that we are analyzing. And it's known for these uh, three geometries that for the square lattice, because of the Van Hove singularity, we, as soon as uh, we turn on the correlations, we have an insulator. For the triangular lattice, uh, early studies have placed the critical U for the mod transition around 7 and 8. And, um, for the honeycomb lattice, it's around 3.8 in units of hopping. So uh, we know where the system is becoming an insulator. So uh, uh, an intermediate uh, quantity we need to calculate in order to get the, the Seebeck coefficient is the entropy. So we get the entropy by integrating the density uh, over the chemical potential, the derivative of the density with respect to the temperature. Here, I present the entropy in units of uh, the Boltzmann constant. And we see here in all three cases that as we turn the correlations on, we start to see a dip forming at half filling. 
I marked the dip here, and this is uh, the MOTS insulator uh, appearing. We know um, that the MOT insulator has uh, some lower entropy than the neighboring uh, metallic regions because uh, uh, the state has uh, less states are occupied. So we understand that this, this deep is the formation of the MOT insulator. And uh, one, also, one thing that's also interesting to notice is like uh, around densities uh, that are away, are away from half filling, uh, small fillings and large fillings, all the curves are close together, and we see that uh, correlations play little to no effect in this range of densities, and that the range of densities where correlations are relevant depends strongly on uh, the, the geometry. So for the honeycomb lattice until 0.5, we see almost no effect of correlations. Uh, other quantities that we are going to get, especially the conductivity because it's needed for the power factor, are the density of states and conductivity. Uh, in order to get these quantities, what we do usually on quantum Monte Carlo is uh, we have to invert this Laplace transform here, uh, one uh, for the Green's function and, and here one where we have the current-current correlation function. And we avoid doing this uh, Laplace inversion on the conductivity by using this trick that is replacing tau with beta over 2 on this side. And then this is approximately the, the conductivity. And for the density of states, we use this uh, relation with the compressibility. So here are our results. So the density of states is, are here on the left panel, if you're facing it, and the conductivity on the right panel. And what we see uh, in both cases, once again, the MOT transition is signaled here uh, at half filling. We see this clear dip where the conductivity is going to zero as we increase um, the correlations, and uh, we see clearly also that uh, the triangular lattice is non-symmetric, and the peaks in the below and above half filling are switched as we look at uh, the height in the conductivity and in the density of states. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear. The role of spin correlations and how it affects magnetic order here. Can you? Say yeah. That? So we didn't get the spin correlations in these cases. Uh, we are still above the uh, phase transition is only at t equals zero in this case because we are at t equals zero, but uh, uh, we didn't probe that. So. There, there's a condition for that approximation to be valid. Can you remind us of what it is? Uh, I just forgot. <laughs> yeah, so it's not going to work very well on very low temperatures, but we are at... Oops, I went to the wrong direction. Yeah, I didn't put it here, but this is also for uh, T equals one half of the hopping, so we still believe it's, it's okay in this range. So now I turn to the Zeebeck coefficient, which is what uh, we really want to uh, point out here. And so we use Kelvin's formula. That is a way of extracting it from the entropy. And this, I, I place it here, it works on low frequency. So when correlations are large enough. And uh, one thing that is very, very important here is that the sign of the Zeebeck coefficient is related to the carrier. So for a negative uh, sign, we have holes, and for a positive uh, sign of the Zeebeck coefficient, we have electrons, and I have uh, placed this plus and minus on the plots to, to make it easier to see. So, uh, yeah. So what we see here for the square lattice, we see only one change in sign at half filling, so below half filling, this is the u equals zero case. Uh, below half fillings, we have uh, hollow, uh, holes and uh, above electrons. And um, for the triangular lattice, uh, we see that this change in, in carrier occurs at a different uh, density, 1.42, which is 
market here, and the honeycomb lattice is more interesting as we have uh, three changes here. So here at uh, 0.6 and 1.4, we have uh, extra changes in, in the coefficient and also at half filling due to particle hole symmetry. So what happens when we turn correlations in these three cases? Uh, well, this uh, first thing we see is this strong increase of the Z-back coefficient near half filling. And in the triangular lattice, we see extra sign changes that were not present before. And uh, here, additional uh, sign density changes. And as these figures are too crowded, I will look into them into with more detail. So I'll start looking at the triangular lattice. I zoomed in the region of interest, which is around half filling. And I to zoom in, I, I cut off the z back coefficient here above and below. So it goes higher than that and below that. So close to half filling, around 0 0.99, 96, we have a peak here that shows a, a steep increase on the z-back coefficient, which is what we uh, are interested at at the beginning. But here, uh, there is something very interesting. We see the lines as we uh, increase correlations, the crossing, the point where the z-back coefficient change sign moves to lower u over to lower density as we increase u, and the effect of that is interesting. If we think for uh, u equals zero, we have a, a positive carrier. As we turn correlations on, we end up with a negative carrier. So uh, the increase of correlation changes the, the nature of the carrier in, from holes into electrons in this region of density. And so this is very interesting. And um, for the honeycomb lattice, we see something similar. So once again, the, as we increase correlations, the crossing points are moving this time towards uh, higher densities. As a matter of fact, they both uh, move toward densities close to half filling. So as we approach half filling and increase correlations, we see uh, the moving uh, to, to higher densities. And in this case as well, uh, we see uh, an interesting effect this way, the other way around. As we turn correlations on, we move from uh, electrons to holes as we increase correlations. And uh, I, I'm only showing here half, but here as we are in a particle hole symmetric case, the same occurs in uh, densities above half filling 1.2 to 1.7, but there we will see an increase and not a decrease uh, going from... Uh, host to electrons. And so uh, here is what happens for the square lattice. We see here uh, we move away from half filling, which is the other way around as what we saw uh, on, um, on the square and triangular lattices. As we increase correlations, we move to lower densities. We move away from half filling. And the uh, also here, uh, we don't see the, the top here because uh, I wanted to highlight this part, but we have very large z-back coefficient, very close to half filling. And uh, for uh, the square lattice, we worried about checking what, what's happening for different temperatures. So in the previous plots, I only had uh, 0.5 here, I have increased the temperature. I have not mentioned, but as we are going, doing sweeps through the lattice and we are with the positive uh, U, uh, repulsive Hubbard model, we do have some sign problem. And so we cannot keep decreasing the temperature and further and further. So to analyze the effect of temperature, we did the other way around. We increased the temperature. And what we see uh, is that decreasing the temperature increases the z-back coefficient, but there is also something uh, interesting going on here. We have two points here around 0.5 and 1.5 where uh, nearly all the curves cross. So when we look here at the z-back coefficient as a function of temperature, we have this uh, at uh, half filling, we see that it's always zero. 
uh, as expected, but we have these densities close to 1.5 uh, and 0 0.5, where the Z-back coefficient is almost constant. And uh, here we see that close to half filling, as this plot, as this data here, we see a fast increase as we decrease temperature. So this is uh, relevant. One thing that is very interesting is that this change of sign that takes place here uh, close to half filling due to correlations is uh, very closely connected to the Fermi surface reconstruction. In the absence of correlations, we would have only uh, electrons here, but we see that as correlations are turned on, we see this uh, little piece here between 0.9 and half filling, where we see uh, here is between 1 and 1.1. Uh, a change in the sign of the carrier. So if we start here at uh, a higher temperature, uh, a higher density, 1.4 in this region, we have uh, electrons as your um, carriers. And here, uh, the dashed black line is the U equals zero. So it's the same kind of Fermi surface we had when we had the correlations turned off. But as we move here, to densities close to this, where this peak is forming, uh, what we see is that the Fermi surface character has changed from hole to, uh, to from electron to hole, which is here where our peaks are located. So we see a reconstruction of the Fermi surface, and this is uh, reflected on the Z-back coefficient. So now I turn to the power factor. Uh, here, uh, the power factor, as I mentioned before, is the product of uh, the Z-back coefficient squared and the conductivity. So it's really a, a competition between the two effects. We know that uh, at half filling, the conductivity is going to be zero in the mod insulator cases when we increase U. And so this is going to push in the vicinity of uh, of half filling the, the power factor down, but we see in some cases we have that spike very close to half filling, so these two quantities are competing to see where a peak is formed. I think the battery ran out and I cannot point anymore, but uh, for the square lattice, which is the upper panel here, oh, this one is working. Where? Oh, great. So here uh, for the square lattice, what we see once again, oh, here is, is eaten, but it's the density here and the power factor in units of uh, Boltzmann const constant square, uh, electron and, and H. And what we see here is uh, the black line is the non-interacting case, and it's going to zero close to half filling at half filling, and here correlations drive it up. It's hard to see, but it has it goes up and has a dip here exactly at half filling. But we have these wings here at densities close to half, where correlations are pushing the power factor up. So we have these regions around half and 1.5, and very close to half filling, where correlations drive um, the power factor up. Uh, I'll turn to the honeycomb before, and then I'll go back to the square lattice. So here we see a similar effect as in the square lattice, which is close to half filling. We see an increase, but at half filling exactly, it goes to zero. And we have these regions we here where correlations play an important role by uh, increasing the power factor. But I think the most interesting case is the triangular lattice, was as we see that due to the lack of particle hole symmetry, uh, we don't have this constraint here that it has to go to zero at half filling for the non-interacting case. And correlations can increase the, the power factor and also tune the power factor to lower density. So uh, when tuning is um, addressed, this is uh, an interesting way of dealing with it. So. Uh, we have uh, peaks around 0.4, and this here is the most interesting case. Oops. 
So I come to the conclusions here uh, faster than I thought. Uh, the anomalous Seebeck coefficient near half filling, uh, the, there is this changing sign which is uh, related to the Fermi surface reconstruction. These anomalies are intensified both by temperature reduction and increasing correlations. Uh, away from half filling and at intermediate densities, uh, we see these peaks in the power factor that have strong contributions both from the conductivity uh, and are uh, strongly dependent on uh, geometry. And uh, the thermoelectric power factor displays a competition between the Zeebeck coefficient and conductivity. So uh, I want to thank you all and also wish uh, Eduardo a, a happy birthday. And I just want to say something. Uh, uh, there are many of uh, former students from Eduardo here and people from Unicampi who have studied with him. And I've been thinking this past few days I could easily have been considered the competition. And it's very uh, good to, to know that that was never the case. We have a very friendly environment among the strongly correlated com uh, community here in Brazil. And I uh, thank Eduardo for, for that as well. So thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, we have time to question. So, OK. Thank you for this very ex interesting talk and beautiful results. So really a lot of interesting new features discovered here. Uh, so I have a set of very specific questions. In the Hubbard model, uh, we know that uh, the mod gap can open at very high temperatures, but spin correlations associated with antiferromagnetism, even though in 2D they're suppressed, but uh, they kick in at an energy which is comparable to uh, the super exchange and so forth. In cuprates and so forth, you have pseudo gap stuff and uh, well, these are temperatures of the order of, say, uh, hundreds of kelvins. And uh, so this is maybe, I don't know, two or three or five, uh, not more than 5% of the Fermi temperature. My impression is, from quickly looking at your numbers, that your temperature range is actually somewhat higher than that, where the magnetism would probably, or magnetic correlations probably don't play such a big role. Yeah, so and I... I, I I have data not for this work, but you uh -huh. know from previous work, and I do know that for this temperature, uh, magnetic correlations, at least for the square lattice, which is uh -huh. best known, is not really set in for uh, the temperature uh, point uh, half point five that we are uh -huh. looking into here. So, but uh, uh, so I wanted to specifically, you know, uh, for example, in the DMFT approximation, the spin correlations are totally disregarded. Uh, uh, and momentum dependence of the self energy. So, uh, the fact that, if correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the fact that the, your dispersions of your Fermi surfaces, how they evolve the temperature, it seems to follow the momentum dependence of the non interacting uh, regime, at least in some, in some cases. Mm -hmm. That suggests that the self energy should be momentum, in, uh, have a weak or in, in negligible momentum dependence. So, my, my question is how do you think, because lots of work have been done with the MFT on the same issue. Uh, how does it compare? Are you aware of comparisons between this kind of results and, and the MFT results, which completely ignore spin correlations? And so would you get similar results in that, in that way or, or not? Yeah, so there is work by uh, Tremblay on the Zeebeck effect, but he does this for 3D, the FCC lattice. So uh, then it's different in, in this regard. And he also sees uh, an increase uh, of the Zeebeck coefficient uh, near half filling. But uh, uh, I am not sure about uh, that. I don't think he has examining, examined this sign changes uh, that take place and the relation of these with... Uh, and what about that enhancement at 50% doping you've seen in triangulitis? This is very interesting. And do you have any understanding why such a big effect? Uh, I, I think you showed one. Uh, later, where we're near 50%, there was a huge enhancement. Less, less, less. Oh, the power factor. Yeah, the power yeah factor. so uh, this is something uh, I have never seen in, in uh, DMR and in DMFT. Uh, 
uh, because this is the power factor. And here we have the contribution for both the CBAC effect, which I have seen, and also there, there are some calculations of the conductivity through the MFT, but I have never seen uh, anybody worry about getting the power factor. And the best thing to do would be also getting the, the thermal conductivity and get, getting the figure of merit which is uh, of most interest for the experimentalists. Uh, why but why do you have such a strong effect at 50% doping, which is really not a strongly correlated regime in some sense, right? Uh, he, oh. Yeah. That, that's here. really the puzzling kind of to me. Oh, I, I see. Well, uh, let me move back to the triangular lattice. So here we see uh, around 0.5. Uh, we see a, a, a decrease on the z back coefficient that this is square, so in, this is contributing to increase. But uh, in this particular case, this comes from, uh, oops, this comes from here. So we have this peak on the conductivity. Uh, so it, it doesn't come from the z back it comes from the conductivity. Of course, the z back is... Uh, non-negligible, otherwise it would bring the power factor down, but in that case in particular, it comes from the conductivity. So it's a very uh, fine match between the two of them. So it, it, it brings it up. Uh, just a quick question, because Vlad asked the other questions I wanted to ask. Uh, the cobalt baltate, what is the dope in there? Because it's a triangular lattice, right? Yeah. Uh, is it close to that peak that you have? Uh, the, oh, the value? Yeah, no, the, the doping of the cobaltate. The, the, I don't know. You don't remember? If, if it's <laughs> in the ballpark of the doping. Yeah, I, I should peak. check. I, I don't okay. know. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Teresa, you don't measure, but the magnetic correlations are included in this approach. Yeah, no? so, so yeah. So they are there, no? They are. Yeah, uh, and... Uh, uh, you mentioned about the thermal conductivity. Can you uh, has been the, the Wittmann france ratio has been studied in this kind of system? Yeah, so uh, I, I discussed with this with uh, Nandini a while ago that we should, you know, push this forward and, and try to get that. But this uh, has not been uh, calculated. Thank you. Just a question which is partly technical and partly about physics. So. I assume that if you would go to lower temperatures, you run into sign problems? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for the square lattice, for instance, would it be feasible, at least for these temperatures, to include T prime in order to break particle hole symmetry and then perhaps also to get interesting or more, I mean, to see a significant enhancement also on the square lattice? Yeah, so uh, the triangular lattice is closely related to the T prime case. You could think you only have a T prime in, in one direction. So I believe the, the kind of sign problems we've run into, we would run closely related sign problems in the square with the T prime. So why not, you know, not lower temperatures, but this uh, particular temperature we have reached here. If we did for the triangular lattice, we could do for the square with T prime. And there, there are many interesting uh, questions raised on the square with the T prime. So, so, so um, I mean, also physics related. So, so these, these sign changes, which you see, uh, the correlation driven sign changes in the Seebeck coefficient. Uh, and you, you showed, showed this Fermi surface reconstruction. So I presume that this happens also on the other lattices where you see these. Yeah, so uh, uh, Will Dawani did some plots on the honeycomb uh, Fermi surface. We didn't uh, pursue it very much, but it's also there. It, it I mean, coming from cuprate physics, it somehow feels that, that all, this is what you would call pseudo-gap physics, right? So it's a high temperature mm -hmm. precursors of pseudo-gap. Mm -hmm. now, now, there have been some investigations of pseudo-gap physics also on the triangle that is uh, based on cluster DMFT. Did, did you try to, to, to correlate what you find with what they find? So I'm thinking about Antoine Georges' recent papers uh, on that. No, we, we haven't. Okay, because th there have been some claims around that the triangle lattice is very different concerning pseudo-gap physics uh, compared to the square lattice. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, I mean, y yours looks, I would say, m more similar. I mean, there are Fermi surface reconstruction in both cases. So mm -hmm. it'd be very interesting to get more insights yeah. there. Okay. So, okay. Just a very technical question, because it turns out uh, I recently developed some interest in uh, thermal conductivity and CPAC coefficient myself. 
And one of the difficulty I have, and I have not done enough literature search, but I haven't found the answer to my question, namely, you show us that there is a current current uh, correlation function which you use your approximate. But nonetheless, assuming that you can calculate current current correlation function, and then you have some other method to combine the entropies and things like that to get CPA coefficient, which I presumably is semi-classical, right? What my question is, ideally one should think about a way to define thermal conductivity and CPA coefficient directly using Kubo formula as a linear response, right? Ideally. Yeah, so... Uh... And uh, the difficulty is, how do we define the current, current coefficient function, but the current being the heat current? Mm -hmm. Meaning that it need to carry not a charge, but a heat with it. But heat, or Hamiltonian, is non-local. So unless we impose some semi-classical bound, it's very hard to define a rigorous heat current and use that in the Kubo formula. So the technical question is, are you aware of any literature that you can maybe point toward that we can help to find the rigorous many-body definition of a heat current and the corresponding thermal conductivity? Uh, Thank you. No, I am not aware of that, but I would point you to Shastri's uh, paper, uh, at least for the um, Z-back coefficient, he, he does a, a rigorous uh, derivation, and we use the Kelvin formula, but there are formulas for other limits, so uh, at least for the Z-back coefficient, this is well established, and, and Shastri is, is the one to look for. All right, thank you. Um, just a quick answer to Wei's question. There is a rigorous way to define it. Luttinger did it in the 60s using the pseudo-gravitational field. All right, so please, uh, I'll get to you uh, to get the rest. Okay, so we are almost over the time. So let's thank the speaker again.